the last 15 years, nothing has come close to the performance of Bitcoin. So looking into the future, if I want to store value for the next 10, 15, 20 years, uh, nothing beats Bitcoin. 70 countries or something like that use the US dollar as a primary currency and then some of the countries that have their own currency even use as a secondary currency the US dollar. So this gives them even a wider range of, of possibilities to export the inflation and uh, impose their, their force on the world. If you look at the business between China and Russia, all we are seeing is these guys moving away from the US dollar. A lot of people are finding an escape through Bitcoin. What do you think is the role that Bitcoin plays in the financial markets? Like what, what do you see? What is Bitcoin for you in the role of all the financial markets? Where do you see Bitcoin will find its place? Well, uh, personally, I use Bitcoin as a store of value. Um, being in the investing space, there's uh, quite a number of uh, things or asset classes that you can use to store value over time. So I cover a lot about forex trading. I look at stocks, indices, and all that. So while all of these assets tend to perform well, if, especially if you're really good at what you do in investing, uh, over time, in the last 15 years, nothing has come close to the performance of Bitcoin. So looking into the future, if I want to store value for the next 10, 15, 20 years, uh, nothing beats Bitcoin. So but uh, technically, I will do a lot of stuff, uh, working really hard to create value in the space. But once I have that surplus income, I use Bitcoin to store that value over time. Amazing. And uh, maybe for people that don't know, like what is Forex trading? So uh, in Forex trading, uh, all we do is uh, speculate, uh, trying to speculate between the exchange rate of different currencies. So mostly we cover the most liquid ones. Uh, for instance, the euro trading against the dollar. So after doing some analysis and you realize, let's say, the dollar is clearly against the euro, then you buy the dollar, sell the euro, and then you close position with the profit. Okay, uh, really interesting. Do, do you foresee, I mean, this is like a deep topic, but uh, do you foresee a, a world where there's only Bitcoin, like we, we get... And obviously, if, if there's ever coming this point, this will be a point where it's like 100 years in the future, like it's not something that will come tomorrow. Uh, but do you see a, a world where um, Bitcoin is the last, like the, the only currency and the only reserve currency that we have and is kind of then eliminating forex trading? Well, uh, predictions over the, the long term about the future tend to be wrong a majority of the times. So um, what I foresee is a period of time uh, between now and let's say the next 10 years when a lot of people, as well as uh, companies, this could expand as, as far much as governments, where say the single base assets that people use to store value transitions from other assets to Bitcoin. So for instance, uh, here in Kenya, majority of people tend to store value in land or real estate. <clears throat> so by the time you finish uh, campus and uh, you are looking for your first job, once you get into gainful employment, immediately you feel societal pressure to buy a piece of land to store some value for your future or for your retirement. So over time, we are seeing a lot of people open up to Bitcoin, starting to realize that uh, it's a much better store value over time. So... Right now, we are seeing that happening in Kenya. I know guys in the U.S. majorly use the stock market as a stock value because it tends to beat inflation or match inflation over time. So what I see in the future is a most likely a scenario where Bitcoin first becomes a reserve asset before now starting to eliminate the need of other currencies. So it might not happen in my generation where Bitcoin becomes the one single asset being used as money. But for now, I believe the fiat currencies might uh, be holding for at least uh, the next generation. Yeah, I also think so, like the, the currencies, like governments will hold on to their currency as long as humanly possible. They They will... They want to have this this kind of impact in the market because this this gives him also like a really great power. 
Um, what do you see like when 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 you are looking now at that future where Bitcoin is actually like a, a reserve currency or like it's it's at the, a really good adoption rate? Um, do you think this can actually change something, or maybe even speci uh, especially for Africa or Kenya, um, when when we have countries that are relying on 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 other con co countries' currencies, when all of a sudden there is Bitcoin as a massive chance for them? Could this lift up the uh, other nations like Africa, like also El Salvador is now doing in real time, like other nations, especially when uh, the US dollar and then America maybe is losing their reserve currency status with like uh, how many countries have the US dollar, like 70 countries or something like that, use the US dollar as a primary currency. And then some of the countries that have their own currency even use as a secondary currency the US dollar, so this gives him, them even a wider range of, of possibilities to uh, yeah, export the inflation and uh, impose their, their force on the world. How do you see this playing out when, when Bitcoin is becoming strong and stronger and getting to a really significant, mon uh, significant uh, amount of adoption? Mm, uh, I would say it's, uh, diff uh, it has different impacts uh, for different countries. Uh, for instance, if you look at the business between China and Russia, uh, all we are seeing is these guys moving away from the U.S. dollar, especially following the confiscation of over $300 billion uh, from Russia as a result of the invasion of Ukraine. But then, if you look at the countries in the global south, especially in uh, sub-Saharan Africa, you realize that these economies are getting more and more dollarized rather than uh, the dollarization. So, um, case in point, for the last, what, uh, two and a half years, uh, we have seen the U.S. go for the fastest fastest rate hikes ever, from 0.1% to 5.5%. So, this created a massive uh, dollar demand, because if you just convert your local currency, for instance, converting cash shilling to the dollar, and holding, on, let's say, to a U.S. treasury in that position, you are bound to make more money, literally, than any other asset class around. So, uh, for instance, last year, the cash shilling uh, lost about 24% to the dollar. So, anyone who just simply converted their cash shilling to the dollar, they were up 24%. And if they just used those dollars to invest into a dollar-backed asset, could be SP500, could be US treasuries, they probably made more than anyone else or any other asset class locally. So bonds underperformed, people investing in money market funds are underperformed. So this uh, trend where interest rates are really high and uh, US treasuries are giving some good returns is creating demand for the dollar in sub-Saharan Africa. So this trend of de dollarization might be working well for uh, bigger economies like uh, China, Russia, but it's not working very well for sub-Saharan economies, uh, mainly because our our economies are basically net importers, so we have a very high demand for the dollar, and at the same time we are heavily dependent on our loans from uh, these uh, global institutions like the World Bank, the IMF, and so on. So it's uh, very tricky for us. We find ourselves more reliant on the dollar compared to these other economies. So well, we are seeing a scenario where at some point the U.S. is going to be forced to continue expanding supply and uh, the dollar continues weakening, then this is where Bitcoin comes in. So the base use case for Africa is uh, also a little bit different. Uh, Africa is a compartment, I would say compartment um, divided. Uh, we have like different ju jurisdictions across 54 nations, and it's very hard to transfer money from one country to another, or the costs are really high. So, as our currencies continue depreciating against the dollar, you find that more and more laws are being implemented to stop people from moving away from the local currency. So, for instance, uh, you will see limitations as to how much dollars you can hold in your account, or how much you can withdraw in your commercial bank account. So you find that a lot of people are finding an escape through Bitcoin. So if you're a business that serves uh, cross-border transactions, let's say you're serving East Africa, Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, you realize that Bitcoin is becoming a more effective way to do cross-border transactions. 
So it's coming in as an easy solution for you to be able to send money peer to peer and uh, transact without these limitations. It's it's fascinating to see, um, especially when you look at the um, the loans that you get from the IMF and the other like institutions. Um, this is like a highly dependent state of from the United States uh, that uh, countries have, like Africa. Um, and so you are saying that's like it's kind of dangerous to get too fast away from that because you are dependent on those those loans. What well, is that right? Well, I'm not saying it's dangerous. I'm, I'm just saying that um, it's more of a capture that a majority of these economies cannot honestly try to run away from the dollar because they still need the dollar to do other transactions. Uh, for instance, um, for the I would say for the last couple of decades, a majority of African nations could not do transactions without the dollar. So even if we are transacting with a country next to us, we would have to convert, let's say, a shilling to dollar, and then, let's say, dollar to Tanzanian shillings. So the dollar has been the core or the backbone of our financial system. So for us, um, for instance, if you want to import cars from Japan, uh, there was no in between where we could, uh, let's say, trade directly with Japanese yen. So we still have to find dollars in the market and then use do those dollars to buy the Japanese yen to import cars. So that has been the backbone for majority of African countries. And uh, as long as this remains the system, it's very hard for African countries to de, to de, de, de dollarize. Yeah. 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 The there's a reason why it's it's, it's so strong in that and you described it quite well uh, how how deeply rooted uh, the the system the fiat system is in all all the countries and how hard it is to to get get rid of it what's your current like what are your thoughts actually on on the on the global game theory playing out a little bit like we have El Salvador that has Bitcoin adopted I don't know about if you know about Suriname like a really small small Latin uh, country like six hundred thousand people only. Uh, where the president or the future president with Maya uh, is really uh, passionate about Bitcoin and she has high chances of winning. We have Argentina, where the president is saying, uh, let's bust all the central banks, which is uh, really interesting. And he's like an Austrian economic uh, kind of a, a guy. Um, how do you see this, this this playing out in the in the short run? Do, do you foresee more? Bitcoin countries coming in. What what's your thoughts on Argentina, El Salvador? Uh, is is that also something that Africa might start? Because especially I think Nigeria is is the the country with the highest adoption rate from the grassroots adoption rate. What I heard, uh, there are a lot of uh, use cases in Africa for for that. Well, uh, I've been following closely the story of uh, El Salvador, and I think it's a uh, really big story for the world about Bitcoin. Um, from what we are seeing is that more and more countries are looking the Bitcoin way compared to, I would say, five years ago where out of countries were either indifferent or hostile against Bitcoin adoption. So what we are seeing is more and more countries being open-minded, uh, especially after what happened with the uh, U.S. spot Bitcoin ETFs. So U.S. being a global leader in terms of a regulatory framework, now we are seeing other uh, regulators across different nations being uh, taking a softer stance in terms of uh, Bitcoin regulation or cryptocurrency regulation. So uh, I believe that's the first step where we take a softer stance. But then the next step is about adopting Bitcoin uh, or allowing citizens or sovereign funds to have an exposure to Bitcoin. So going forward, I, I'm expecting that there will be some countries that will take the front roll of uh, buying when more Bitcoin. But as we know, uh, this, this limitation of uh, 21 million. And uh, at this point, I don't think there's enough for every country to adopt and buy massively the same way uh, we have seen Mycosila buying Bitcoin. So at some point, to be, this is uh, the available supply. Uh, right now, it's, uh, I believe, around 2 million Bitcoins uh, around uh, the <coughs> global exchanges. So the moment more and more countries and uh, operations go for this remaining supply, 
you you realize that there will be a pace to get the last Bitcoin. So at some point, you will see even countries printing money just to get a portion of that Bitcoin so that uh, they hold uh, a position in that. Uh, I tend to think of it as digital property. So if this digital property is limited to 21 million, at least everyone needs a share. So it's a matter of uh, when rather than uh, uh, a matter of if. Yeah, uh, it's it's uh, very true. And I'm curious how you like came to all those conclusions. Let's dive a little bit into uh, what you did uh, to to came here. You're also like a writer at Forbes, uh, and and you have a, a lot of videos also on, on YouTube that I saw, uh, and you're active also on Twitter. Um, after school, you you probably went at high school, and you said like I think you went into trading already then uh how what, how was your path uh, to b before you discovered bitcoin well um i'm a student of uh, actuarial science i studied at a local technical university called technical university of kenya um after that i dived right into trading so i've been trading for over a decade now uh majorly forex trading Uh, then around 2015, 2016, this is when I had my first interaction with Bitcoin. Uh, bought my first Bitcoin at about $1,000. But uh, having this trader mindset, I was not invested in uh, realizing the philosophy of Bitcoin, what it is or how it works. So I was in there for the trade. So the moment I got 3x, I just sold my Bitcoin and I had a very successful trade. So fast forward... After that, I went into other cryptocurrencies, uh, traded quite a good number of them, uh, like uh, Ethereum, all those shit coins. I went through the entire rabbit hole. Then, at some point, I lost everything. Uh, fast forward, this was an uh, Australian exit called Cryptopia. Uh, at one point, uh, it closed down and I lost all my coins. And uh, I had to start from zero again, uh, started researching, understanding uh, what really holds value, what doesn't hold value. Um, then I transitioned to this uh, position where I was looking at Bitcoin and perhaps the top 10 coins in the crypto market. So I'd be looking at uh, Ethereum, Binance and stuff. Then after researching further, I realized that these other people are its kind of shift every cycle. So if you look at the different cycles in Bitcoin, Uh, you look at the top 10 uh, cryptocurrencies in the first cycle, top 10 in the second cycle, top 10 in the third cycle. Uh, they kind of shift every time. So it's um, it's like playing that game of whack-a-mole. Um, this time uh, you got the best pick, next time you uh, get the worst pick and so on. So the one crypto asset that actually stood firm or, or over all these cycles was Bitcoin, always number one. So that's when I took a deep dive, uh, tried researching, understanding what it is, how it works. And then uh, eventually I dropped all those uh, alternative assets and focused on Bitcoin 100%. Yeah, amazing. And, and uh, you also said that uh, you traded in the beginning, uh, which uh, is like I always try to like just hold on, um, which brings me to a, a question like, is Does it actually matter when you buy Bitcoin? Is there any model that you uh, look at? Uh, like there are so many different, like there's, there's uh, the, how is it called, Plan B model. Then there's this from Giovanni, the the yeah. net, the power law model. There are like so many different kind of a things that try to time Bitcoin and try to like, when should you get in? There's also like a weighted DCA thing where you always buy in Bitcoin, but that sometimes you buy in more and sometimes buy you in a little bit less uh, like do, do you have anything like that or is like is there any th does the timing matter when you buy bitcoin uh honestly no anytime i have uh, some surplus amount of money i just buy bitcoin so um i, I tried timing it uh some time back uh found myself buying the top of the previous cycle 69k so I collected a lot of funds, especially from my trading activities. Then just put it all in Bitcoin at 69k, and then it at all the big bear market. So since that time, I've been uh, simply buying anytime I have a chance. So if I get a chance to buy, uh, let's say, $20 worth of Bitcoin this week, then it doesn't matter what the price is. 
was this the the, the biggest things that, that that changed in your view of of Bitcoin when you first like encountered it and you traded it, then you went into uh, shit coins as you said, uh, and and now you are here. Like I feel I feel like when when someone is adopting Bitcoin, they always like make a lot of changes how they view Bitcoin and how they even view the the financial markets. Uh, at least for me, like my whole world <laughs> kind of shifted how I think about what money is, uh, what the financial markets are, and how this all interacts with each other. And actually what Bitcoin also is, like this changed a lot in the last four years that I'm in Bitcoin. Um, how, how did this change for you? Like you said, that it's, it's only like uh, you, you traded it. Uh, you probably saw it as like more an asset. Then uh, how do you see it now? Uh, and, and how did also maybe the, the question, what is money for you, uh, change while you were adopting uh, Bitcoin? Well, um, I don't know how to explain it. Uh, first of all, uh, I was deep into DeFi platforms. So I had a view where, you know, you can uh, do on one side uh, the job you do to create value. Personally, it's a uh, trading. I also work as a financial markets analyst with a local forex broker. So once I get that value, I need to store it for a future date. I need to beat inflation, make sure that that value stays in. So, I saw uh, different opportunities. One of them was to literally just pack my money in a DeFi platform uh, where I would get different APYs or annual returns. And then, after packing my money uh, for a couple of months in a DeFi platform, I started realizing that the to tokenomics are not making sense. So, uh, we have this platform uh, on top of a layer 2 chain. Uh, and then it's promising 50% plus uh, returns at the end of the year. So when you put your money in there and you lock it, you expect that at the end of the year, you're going to have 50% uh, more coins. And of course, if it's a good market and the coins keep gaining value, then you have some pretty good outlook. Then uh, diving, uh, diving deeper into the chain, you realize that these tokens are not uh, coming just out of anywhere. Uh, the platform is designed to print more tokens that basically adds to the inflation in the ecosystem and you realize that you're getting paid by your own inflation. So that was a deep, uh, deep lesson for me, a uh, deep awakening moment, uh, mainly because it's the same thing happening in the fiat system around us. So if you happen to visit Kenya uh, or understand what's currently happening in Kenya, uh, we are living into what I would describe into a yield farm. So uh, you, these are these financial institutions that we call SACOs, uh, S A W C O. You realize that a lot of Kenyans are packing their money in these SACOs, and then at the end of the year, they get an annual yield of about ten to twelve percent. So there are also other people are uh, backing money in a what we call money market funds. Uh, they're getting uh, ten plus. Uh, returns, maybe 13% at the end of the year. Uh, then we have the treasury bonds, which are also bond retail, meaning that the average Kenyan can, can invest directly with the central bank, uh, buy a bond, and then get 16-17% at the end of the year. So, like, literally everyone who is just saving money, they're getting 10% plus within the country at the end of the year. But the real question is, where is this yield coming from? So the yield is basically uh, increased money supply, which is basically means uh, we are all getting paid by our own inflation. So yes, everyone gets 10%, but then the price of everything goes up by 10% plus. So on book, we have more money, but in terms of real purchasing power, it's going down. So that took me into a really good deep dive into what's happening in the fiat world, what's happening with other cryptocurrencies. And the fact that Bitcoin has this limit and uh, for anyone to get Bitcoin, you have to put in some kind of work, whether you are mining or buying that Bitcoin using fiat from someone else. Then I saw the real value proposition from Bitcoin, and I tend to believe that this will hold value over time. Absolutely. And and you also had a thread on, on Twitter about, about that topic, and you kind of like called FTX before, uh, as you as you uh, told me. Uh, this got... got is in the same direction, right? As like uh, FTX, uh, Celsius, BlockFi, all those those things. You you came to know about it before, right? Yes. Um, 
I remember that time I had just started writing uh, for Forbes. Um, this time I was looking at uh, the policies that are being implemented by different exchanges, and somehow it didn't make sense. Uh, on one side, uh, an average Bitcoin transactions will take a couple of minutes uh, before you get the confirmations and the transaction is complete. But if you're operating within an exchange, let's say you deposit money in a Binance, FTX, uh, or whatever platform that is, if you are moving Bitcoin from one account to another, it's instant. So that's the moment I realized that these transactions are not uh, happening uh, on the chain. Uh, they are only happening on an Excel sheet. Uh, basically meaning that if I transfer some Bitcoin from uh, my account to your account on an exchange platform, they don't actually transfer that money physically. It's just numbers changing on a spreadsheet. So then I realized that uh, the only time that these guys are actually uh, transacting on the chain is when you're making a deposit, meaning that you're moving your Bitcoin from your wallet to their wallet. And then when you're making a withdrawal, that's when you're moving Bitcoin from their wallet to your wallet. But then if you're making uh, these transactions on their platform, you'll just be shifting numbers on the chain. And of course, it makes sense uh, you don't want to save on those transaction costs. But then uh, I also saw that there was this attempt for a lot of people, uh, attempt to make a lot of people retain their money within the ecosystem. So they didn't want people withdrawing, so they were just promoting, depositing, trading, but never withdrawing. So for a majority of the exchanges that time, uh, it was more about bringing in more cash, but nothing goes out. So the uh, depositing was free, but withdrawals were being charged that time. So then, uh, looking at the entire bear market, that, and at that time, uh, that's when the bear market was just starting, I realized that price was going down, but the number of new owners was just increasing, a uh, number of new buyers was just increasing, so somehow it didn't make sense to me. But then I realized that uh, these guys are rehypothecating the Bitcoin. So every time uh, you guys, uh, myself and other people in the system, uh, deposit money in the system. Uh, every time we trade or buy a bit more Bitcoin, as long as it remains within the exchange, then the exchange is able to use that Bitcoin to lend to other people or whatever that means. So eventually it came to light when uh, we realized that FTX was basically using clients' funds to trade on Alameda. So it was uh, just a few weeks after I had done my post, then uh, we saw the entire FTX thing. If you are listening to this podcast, you might be wondering what is actually the setup look like of Robin or how can I improve my Bitcoin setup? And there's two things. You have to buy Bitcoin from the right source and you have to store Bitcoin the right way. Let's focus on the first thing, how to buy Bitcoin. It's simple. Have a Bitcoin only exchange. Don't deal with the shitcoin exchanges. Don't deal with an exchange that has an own token or something like that. Be on a Bitcoin only exchange. I use 21 Bitcoin. 21 Bitcoin is for me the best partner for that. And now where do you store Bitcoin? Bitcoin should be stored on a hardware wallet, on a self-custody solution where you yourself hold your keys and it should be a cold wallet. So that's my simple solutions. That's a Bitbox. You just put your Bitcoin on there, back up your seed phrase, and you are better than 95% of all Bitcoin hodlers. If you have more than a thousand euros in Bitcoin, it's an absolutely must have. One last thing before we get back to the video. I'm really passionate about meeting other Bitcoiners. And there's an amazing opportunity in middle of Europe in June, the Bitcoin Prague Conference. It's the best and biggest Bitcoin only conference in the whole of Europe. For all Americans, please visit Europe and visit this place in June. For all Europe's, it's a must go anyways. You are so close to the Bitcoin Prague conference, you basically have to come. I will do interviews there and I would love to meet you all there. Use code ROBIN for all my sponsors to get discounts and use the links down in the description. There, there, there were a lot of... Uh, um, even uh, popular voices, I think like Corey Clipson also was one of them that actually said before, like this, this thing is not sustainable. You, you like the, just look at the numbers as you also described now, like when you look at everything that's there for looking at it, it's like no secrets. 
uh, they they cannot make uh, money from that. So like uh, this brings me back to just like the importance of self custody. Like you have to take your own uh, keys, especially if if you have any significant of money uh, in the exchange. Um, uh, one topic that might be interesting. Um, how do you look at uh, UTXO, like, uh, I don't know, UTXO management, because when you have like in transfer Bitcoin uh, from the exchange to like an hardware wallet, self custody wallet, uh, of course, if it's a really small amount, it can be stuck there. They can be like, just like in there. Uh, and and I feel like, especially in countries where the, the people are struggling a little bit more uh, or like the, the income level is not as high, it could really fast, push them out of the base layer. Uh, do you see this already happening where a lot of people in Africa just use the lightning layer or like the, the, the second layer because they fear that the UTXOs are too small for in, in order to maybe spend it in, 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 in the future? And maybe just like uh, quickly to, for everybody in the, in, in the uh, audience that does not understand what UTXO management is, um, UTXO is basically when you spend Bitcoin, you always have a UTXO, and if the UTXO is too small, you might be in the in in the position where in the future, when the fees are getting higher and higher, that you cannot spend your Bitcoin without paying more in the fees than the actual Bitcoin are worth. So, um, especially in a country uh, like Africa, this is even more important than uh, than around the world, right? Yes. Um... I think uh, for immediate needs, uh, one needs to simply convert their Bitcoin on-chain to Lightning. Uh, it tends to be more useful, especially if you are doing more frequent transactions. So whenever I'm dealing with, a, a let's say, a beginner in Bitcoin, I normally try to advise uh, them to take two approaches. So on one side, uh, I look at the long-term view of Bitcoin. So this is where you self-custody a big amount of Bitcoin that you think might be useful over the next five, 10 years and so on. And then to at least have a checking account for more frequent expenditure. So uh, the way I visualize this is that uh, for a checking account, it's easier to use Lightning than on-chain because the fees would be much more. But then if it's a Bitcoin you want to hold for five, 10 years, then it's much better to use on-chain. So it's easier to accumulate this amount on an exchange. So if, let's say, you are dollar cost averaging, let's say, $100 a month, uh, $20 a month, uh, it's much easier to put that in an exchange. Uh, you put that uh, every month. And uh, let's say if you get something around $1,000 plus, I don't think the fees will be that big. So in that case, you can consolidate that with the one direct withdrawal to your cold wallet and then store that for a long time. So rather than buying, let's say, twenty uh, $20, $30 worth of Bitcoin, transferring that to your wallet and then adding the UTXOs together, which would uh, literally not make sense at a future date. So it, it's much more easier to either build uh, on an exchange or if you have a lot of transactions that you have accumulated in one wallet, then you might want to make one big transaction into a different wallet. Mm, uh, that's uh, that's uh, that is really good and uh, for people listening if this topic is completely new to you I think I have like 10 episodes back or something like that uh, deep uh, uh, deep episodes with over one hour where we dove deep really into UTX O management what you can do what you can consolidate what are your best practices and stuff like that um, Africa I feel like always when I hear uh, people speaking from Africa, they always told me about the scams that were around Bitcoin uh, in the previous years that uh, were a lot of scams going on with Bitcoin uh, and people are still a little bit uh, shocked because, like, not shocked, but maybe are still a little bit afraid of Bitcoin because of those those uh, scams. Were you also, like, encountering those scams personally? Were you also, like, um, uh, heard some stories about that, or even like someone tried to to get you into this. Those, those scams are just like uh, I'm curious about them because I hear, hear so much about the scams in Africa. In Austria, also had scams in 2017 a little bit, like multi-level marketing schemes. I, I was uh, once asked to get in on one of those, <laughs> and that's why I came so late into Bitcoin. 
But is this also like, did you also encounter those? Uh, well, uh, personally, uh, I'm usually very deep into research, uh, doing uh, background study, studies, whole idea of not been scammed before. Uh, also, a majority of African countries tend to have uh, very weak regulatory frameworks. So it's much easier to get away with a scam or scamming before in Kenya compared to being in the U.S. or the, uh, in a country in the Eurozone. So that has been the breeding ground or the, the reason why there is a lot of scams operating around. So uh, second, uh, education is not like really good in terms of uh, financial literacy. Uh, so we find that a lot of people get scammed all over. So as we speak right now, the even scams running on radio, gazettes, uh, some of them even on TV, especially gambling sector. Uh, some of them even with licenses. And uh, it has become so normalized that there's just too many scams around. So um, we have experienced these as a big challenge, especially in the forex industry. And the way we have been encountering these is by doing more and more financial interest sessions. So our Personally, working with uh, FX PESA, uh, local financial markets broker, uh, we will do financial literacy events free of charge in different parts of the country where we talk to the people, try to help them understand what, uh, what a regulated broker is, what uh, a majority of scams look like, uh, what to avoid, uh, what not to go for. And that has worked very well in uh, establishing this uh, framework of knowledge uh, and uh, thought leadership where you are able to, de to identify that this is the leaders, the system, uh, these are the people who can be trusted and that has gone really well into eliminating the notion that uh, previously people would think forex is a scam and now people know that there is a, a regulated environment and it's a legitimate industry. So on the Bitcoin side, I've seen it happening. Uh, a person uh, gets approached by a scammer and then they come to me and they're like, uh, hi Rufas, uh, do you think these guys can be trusted? Do you think it's a legit platform? And then uh, I advise them based on what the project is. So I've seen it happen over and over again and I believe these financial literacy sessions we do on, whether on YouTube, physical sessions, uh, on X, I think they are really helpful in the industry because they help people determine what is valuable, what is legitimate, and what is uh, not. Yeah, and it's 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 fascinating for me that, like, we have to do so much more education work. That's, that's for me, always the, the, the takeaway from that, uh, because if people are educated about all the scams that are going around, how Bitcoin is verifiable, uh, what what is a real exchange, what is a fake exchange, and stuff like that, then we don't have a real problem. Uh, so we, we just have to push education. It's like kind of the purpose of the podcast to just push education worldwide. That's why I also do it in English. Uh, yeah, really, really cool. I saw, I mean, closer to the end of the podcast, I saw one tweet of yours, which is absolu absolutely not related to Bitcoin, uh, where you talked about why you should stop using multiple monitors. <laughs> do you remember that one? I think... I don't know when it was. Yes, yes. I just I like saw it randomly in in, in my feed. Uh, <laughs> as like as someone who has always free screens, why should I stop using my multiple monitors? <laughs> well, uh, in my experience, um, I've worked with uh, two forex brokers now, and uh, the very first week that you join their company, uh, you get allocated an, an IT guy. They will get you set up. They get you a laptop, a uh, number of monitors, and stuff. So um, I usually reject that, and um, this is mainly because I know and I understand that the human mind can only focus on one thing at a time. So in order for you to achieve like maximum focus, especially on your work desk, you need to reduce the number of decisions that you have to make uh, to a minimum. So if you need to like focus on reading a book, you have to switch off notifications. Every time it, there's an extra decision, it basically reduces your focus. So if you have three different screens and you have to make decisions, uh, move from this screen to that screen to that screen, uh, basically reduces your focus and reduces your productivity. Yeah, definitely. It's, it's, uh, I mean, I always have free screens. I try to like keep things open, but uh, yeah, you might try it because when you're focused on just one thing, it's, it's, it's uh, way nicer. The only thing when I edit videos or do graphic designs, 
it's sometimes nice to have like uh, resources on on the right side where you can quickly get them in and like work on the main thing and i mean the laptop is like my third screen so i don't really count that uh, i sometimes even have the the brightness turned off uh, so so i don't see it uh, because it's such a, s- a small screen compared to the other ones but yeah it's a, it's a in the, it's an interesting topic because i'm really big on be, being focused on one thing that's why i'm only bitcoin that's why i'm only working on this podcast where that's why i'm doing only one thing at a time uh, but i never thought about my my monitors i like i just wanted to <laughs> quickly highlight that on your screen, um, yeah if you think about it uh every every extra tab or an extra monitor is a movement away from the screen right in front of you. So you just have more like rotations where every screen you have is an extra tab. You can just add that as a tab on one screen. Definitely. It's, it's, yeah, I have to think about that. Definitely. Let's see. <laughs> <laughs> and before we get to the end routine of the podcast, I'm always really curious about the guest uh, and, and uh, especially because Bitcoiners are really, really interesting. Um, what are you currently extremely passionate about, w- which we did not cover in the podcast till now? Like, what is there anything besides Bitcoin, besides the financial markets, that yeah, you are extremely passionate about that you want to share? Well, I'm very passionate about chess. Uh, I started a local club in a small town called Ilimudu in Kenya. Uh, we played uh, two seasons in the Kenya Premier League. Uh, before we were kicked out during COVID, uh, it was really difficult to get to attend all the games and stuff. So I'm um, looking to rebuild that. And uh, at the same time, uh, though this is in very early stages, I'm looking to uh, build a Bitcoin hub in Kenya, where we'll have a lot of Bitcoiners coming together, share ideas, because it will have a whiskey club, a restaurant, and uh, all the necessary facilities that make the place better for bitcoiners uh really cool uh, yeah I, I also love chess uh we, we, we next next time we have a podcast we should play chess next to each other <laughs> what, what, what's your what's your elo um, do you know your elo it is uh, around 2100 oh uh, then then we cannot play you are way too good <laughs> no no no, 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 no. That's the chess rating, which is kind of shallow compared to chess.com. Ah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I also play just. Uh, I I use I use chess actually just to like uh, have a have a break, uh, like when I work like two three hours uh, on on a on a row. I either go like for walk or I quickly play a game of chess. It it just like switches my bri- brain to something else, and then I can refocus. So I like chess in that way. But I never really study it. Like I'm not that passionate about it. But I play every day, so I'm getting a little bit better. Like I started with like a 300, 400 elo in the blitz rating. Now I'm like 700, 800. So I'm 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 slowly, slowly progressing. But I should read yeah. books. I would have to study my plays to actually get better. But I don't do that, unfortunately. <laughs> um, maybe, for the end routine in the maybe, podcast, maybe, uh, maybe, hmm? do you grow? Yeah, definitely. Uh, I I have to come to Kenya to 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 your chess club. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, in the end of the in the end of the podcast, we have the end routine where the previous guest is asking a question for the next guest. Uh, and today's question is an interesting one. Uh, if you had the capability to generate endless power, what would you do with it? That's a good question. Oh, the capability to generate endless power. I would just yes, exactly. Do to generate as as much power as as you human want. Yeah. Probably commit suicide. Like <laughs> our family, but uh, nobody should have centralized power. Yes, that that's, sense. That, that that's a good answer. And honestly, I love that. I love that. Yeah. Perfect. Then, uh, yeah, thank you, Rufus, uh, for being on. Uh, before I let you go, um, where can people uh, reach out to you when people want to ask you questions, want to l- learn more about you? Um, where can uh, people find you? Where can people ask you questions? So I'm always active on uh, Twitter. Uh, my Twitter handle is uh, RufusKE. And uh, my question for the next uh, person on the uh, podcast um, I don't know what's the best question for this. 
Um, hmm. Do you have uh, an estate planning, uh, an estate plan for your Bitcoin? A really cool question. I love it. Do you have an exit plan for your uh, Bitcoin? I noted it down. Thank you for 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 giving it. I usually do it offline, but uh, thank you for giving it to me directly. Um, and yeah, it was a pleasure having you on. It was a really a nice meeting you. And yeah, um, thank you for taking the time with us. My pleasure. Thank you.